What is up, guys? Welcome to episode 104 of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. I'm your host, Josh McKinney, and I have a great episode for you guys today. So today I get to interview my friend, Chris Wojcik. Uh, I met Chris when he was a blue belt. I want to say probably like six, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, he is currently a brown belt under Jeff Serafin, who has been on the podcast. And uh, he offers a unique perspective as all the guests do. But uh, what I think people will find really interesting, and this was not what I planned on talking about as much on the podcast. Uh, I honestly plan on talking a lot more about Chris's mindset as a competitor, because he's a very good competitor. And we talked very little about that. Uh, we ended up talking a lot about uh, making money as a writer. And I think that that was really interesting, especially from how big of a response we got uh, from a few episodes ago when we talked about how to make money doing jujitsu uh, and episode 101. If you guys have not heard that episode, you should check it out. But people really liked that idea. Uh, something you'll notice, though, is the big things that I covered were being in person or being a uh uh, uh, being on video, something or on audio for a podcast. Something that Chris does is he makes money writing and uh, he gives you a really good explanation on how he does it, how much uh, writing is required to do it. And it, it's just, uh, it ended up being a lot more of a guide on making money as a writer than I anticipated the episode on being. And I think that you guys will absolutely love that happy accident. Uh, before we get into the podcast, just want to make sure you guys are aware of the Patreon page. If you guys have not checked out the Patreon page, we have two options on it. The first one is for Suck Less Saturday. That is the cheaper option, and it is uh, a once a week episode, once a week podcast that is five to 15 minutes where I break down some aspect of training jujitsu or just some aspect, some deep thought, deep dive on jujitsu. And, uh, then if you guys want any coaching, I only have two spots left for coaching, uh, but it is $97 a month. And what it is, what it requires is a 30-minute uh, Zoom meeting with me. And it could be on jujitsu, but everybody that I've gotten so far would rather uh, do a do coaching on branding and, and learning to build your own jujitsu business. And so um, the coaching has turned into what I thought was going to be about learning jujitsu more efficiently and effectively. And uh, the coaching has turned a lot more into how to brand, how to put action steps in place to be able to make money uh, doing the hobby that we all love. And so if you guys are interested in that, you can go to uh, the I Suck at Jujitsu Show's Patreon page and get signed up. But without further ado, let's jump right into the episode. Here's Chris. All right, Chris, how are you doing today, bud? Good, Josh. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh, just is today a training day for you? What's kind of the start of your day? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, this morning was light, and then I'm drilling at noon, and then I teach the comp class over at Seraphin tonight. So two that's, trainings today, which is That's good. fun. What does your drilling look like? Um, so right now, my drilling is a lot of nogi, um, lots of leg lock drilling, drilling a lot of entries, uh, drilling we've, uh, my buddy Ramsey and I have been obsessively drilling breaking mechanics on leg locks for the last like month. Jeff showed us some really cool stuff. So. We've been so when you say drilling, what do you, what does drilling look like for you? Cause I know it looks different for a lot yeah. of people. Yeah. So for me, I have a wrestling background. So for me, drilling looks like just repetitively doing the move over and over and over and over again. Um, whether that's, you know, repping a guard pass, um, sometimes we do, we call it micro drilling where we isolate like a specific part of the move and we just rep that. So it's like, if we're doing a leg drag, we just do the drag, you know, and we just rep it as many times as you can in like a minute or two. So it's super, super fast drilling. Yes. Yes. We do like kind of more flowy drills, but we'll mostly do that as a warm up. Like our skill development mostly comes from the hard repetitions you know what is your reason for doing that what is your kind of uh what is the thought process behind getting better with that 
So, yeah. So for when I do it, I think of, um, you know, when I'm doing like when I was wrestling, the way that I learned how to do takedowns was to just do a lot of takedowns. But at the same time, it's like, you know, for jiu-jitsu, the movements are smaller, you know, mm-hmm. like because you're not it's not everything is like a big explosive takedown, like a guard pass. You can do a lot and then we can practice it. We practice it at full speed because when we're doing it in the fight, we're doing it at full speed, mm-hmm. you know, and we'll break it down. Obviously we do it slower, you know? So when we drill, like, for example, like knee slice is a good example. When we drill the knee slice, we, sh- I drill the part where I shoot my knee through to the floor and I get my underhook. Then I get back up and I drill, shoot the knee to the floor, get the underhook again. And it's just that aspect of the move, because I think for me, I think that's the most important part of the knee split knee slice. Cause when I can get tight with my underhook and get my knee to the floor, I feel like I can pass anybody, but that's the hardest part is getting there. Do you ever spend time drilling? And I'm sure the answer has got to be yes. Maybe not. Maybe you're, maybe you're perfect. Maybe I just struggle with this. Uh, but do you ever <laughs> spend time drilling and it, you, whatever you spent a year doing the same thing and then you find like a better way of doing it. Yes. Yes. That's been like, that's how we've learned leg locks. Basically. Uh, Ramsey's my, uh, Ramsey's Bugar and he's my main drilling partner. And we drill pretty much every day together. And we started drilling K guard is like a perfect example. Um, we started drilling K guard, like after Lachlan did it uh-huh. and we did it wrong for a year. <laughs> And then we sort of learned how to do it and we did it one way for a few months. And then we saw, I saw Craig Jones at who's number one. He did something similar, a different way. So then we were like, Oh no, you have to do it this way. And then I was training with somebody else and they were like, no, it doesn't work if you do it like that. So we're like, okay, we're back to this way. And so we're just kind of, we keep drilling it. We do it every day, but we do it differently a lot because the best, the, the best way to do it, is changing to our, to, you know, in our eyes. You know, that makes I don't think sense. There's, there's not really a best way. Yeah. And I know. think a, a lot of times we're trying to, you know, like a, a big part of getting good at any part of jujitsu or probably getting good at anything is we use the word immerse yourself, but the real word is probably obsess over leg locks, right? Or obsess yes. over a specific leg lock. And just thinking about it a lot can be really, really helpful. Yeah to your progression. So uh, I wanted to kind of dig in. I thought that this would be fun because this is where um, the idea of bringing you on the podcast came from is I signed up for your ebook uh, and it is 15 ways to learn BJJ faster. Okay. So, it, and I thought it'd be a fun place to start. If you only could do one way to learn jujitsu faster, um, you only get one choice to you're going to teach a seminar and you get to explain one thing to people, what would you consider the most effective thing for getting better faster? So I think that it depends on the audience because if it's a room full of beginners, it's going to, I would say something different versus a room full of more experienced practitioners. Let's separate them. Let's break it to two questions. First, we'll go beginners. For beginners, I think that the most important thing for a beginner is mat time. Um, so I would say, I think that the step in the book is immersion um, or obsession. I think mm-hmm. that, you know, just putting in the, the hours because when you're a beginner, you don't know that much stuff, you know, mm-hmm. but you learn it a lot faster than you think you do. And the longer, the more time you spend and not even just like training, like being just around the sport, I think helps learn you know, it helps you learn so much faster because you're constantly surrounded by the sport and, you know, your body can't do things as intense as your mind. Mm-hmm. You know, the, I think the most of our minds are stronger than our bodies in jujitsu. So what if they were advanced? What would be the one way micro drilling? Yes. So how do you, this is, uh, this is uh, actually a personal thing. I always struggle when it comes to drilling, deciding what to drill. How do you decide what you should be drilling? So, I mean, really, we just take, you know, we either like look at the tournament or the even just things that happened in training that didn't go well. And I just find, okay, why couldn't I do this? And then we, you know, and I'm lucky I have, you know, a great coach who helps me with 
everything. And so, you know, we'll watch, we'll either watch like a match or we'll watch somebody else's match or we'll be training. And it's like, Hey, why couldn't I do this today? Why couldn't I tap you with this footlock? Why couldn't I finish this guard pass? And it's like, okay, this is what you did wrong. And this is what the proper guard pass look like, looks like. So then we'll say, okay, let's try to get, you know, let's focus on that thing that you did wrong. And then let's just drill the perfect guard pass for that situation into your head with a lot of reps. Because I think a lot of people, as they get more advanced, they stop drilling hard. Mm -hmm. And do you think that that slows things down for them? I think so. Like, I'm not saying that I don't think that you have to drill like, you know, like an obsessive wrestler every single day. Mm -hmm. But I think that like, you know, for a while I was doing my micro drills once a week Mm -hmm. and it was like, okay, it was Friday, Friday during drilling was micro drills day. And we would do, it would be like 20 minutes, you know, but we would go, it's like 60 seconds. I do like five or six rounds. He does five or six rounds. The whole thing takes like 20 minutes. How often do you do it now? Once or twice a week. Still not so crazy, but it's the, the fact that it's like the fact that we get it done weekly. Because it's like, okay, in a 60 second round where I'm repping leg drags or a 60 second round where I'm repping knee slice passes, I can get 75 reps. And how often do you know, most people won't drill 75 of anything Mm -hmm. in a given week. And we did it in a minute. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. So I think that having that, like, because I wouldn't even say it requires a ton of discipline. It just requires like the energy to kind of get started. It's kind of like, like brushing your teeth a little bit. You know, like uh, you wake up, you're like, I don't want to get up and brush my teeth, but then you do it and it's like, okay, that wasn't so bad. And then mm-hmm. you can go on to the next part of training or life or whatever. Then your wife yells at you and says, Hey, you need to brush your teeth. Yeah. So you can do it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, just to stay on this for an extra second. So I, uh, I think I said it when he was on the podcast, but, uh, uh, you know, your coach, uh, Jeff is what I would consider one of the hidden gems of jujitsu. He really has a deep understanding of things, really has a good understanding of how to get good. Uh, if you don't have him to kind of watch video with and stuff like that, or do you feel like it changes how you watch it? Or do you feel like you kind of have the, the process down of, of how to watch video and, and get and decide what you should be drilling, working on next? I think that when I was younger, when I was like white, blue belt, purple belt, it was a, I needed a more guidance for sure. I think now it's more like when I can consult something with Jeff, it's just like an added benefit. Mm-hmm. You know, I think at this point where I'm at now, I feel confident in my ability to like learn things on my own. And when I have, you know, the more like high level jujitsu minds that I have on a given subject, I think that just makes everything better. Mm-hmm. So I think I can learn. Without Jeff, hopefully he doesn't get mad that I'm saying that, but I just think I learn better when I have more people, especially people who are good, who are helping me out. Don't worry. Jeff won't listen. He hates the show. He, he told me he won't. No. Uh, so uh, just one more question on if you had to decide what would be the best way to learn fast. Now, let's say it's not a group of beginners or a group of advanced people, but you have something unique that you came from wrestling, correct? You started wrestling before you did jujitsu, correct? Yeah. I wrestled for six years. Okay. So, uh, uh, what would you say to a group of wrestlers or a wrestler that is trying to make the transition into jujitsu? I think the biggest problem for a lot of wrestlers is ego. And I'll say that as a former wrestler, because I know for me, like I didn't want to tap to things. I didn't want to like play guard. I didn't want to train in the gi. It was like all these like things that I didn't want to do that just made, made it slower. Mm -hmm. You know, I, and it's, if you can just say, okay, I'm going to accept that I'm, cause I think that people don't like sucking at stuff, you know, Mm -hmm. people don't want to suck at jujitsu. They don't, they don't. (laughs) And they definitely don't want to admit that they suck at jujitsu. Yeah. And especially like, if you come from like, like the wrestling, like kind of tough guy culture where it's like, you know, you work super hard and you get good. You don't want to be like, ah, now I'm not tough anymore. Mm-hmm. Cause I lose all the time. <laughs> that but makes sense. I think if as a wrestler coming into jujitsu, if you can just accept that you're going to get tapped and you're going to probably get beat up from every position, except for like wrestling positions, then you'll be able to embrace those positions that you aren't good at faster. 
And then from there, you'll be able to start developing real skills. Like for me, when I was a blue belt, I started, uh, there was one class where Jeff showed lasso, lasso guard, and I loved it for some reason. And then from there, I just started every single round on my back. And pretty much now I start almost every single round on my back in training still, which uh -huh. as a former wrestler is a little bit different. And I think that because of that, that's how I got a pretty good guard. You know, my guard's tough to pass because I start every round from my back. And you also do pull guard in competition too. I've seen do. you yes. do that. When was the first time you pulled guard in competition? You didn't come out to wrestle. So the first time I pulled guard in the tournament was, it, do you know uh, Grayson? He yeah. ran uh, Wanderlust. Uh -huh. I did his micro, his blue belt micro tournament. And I was like, okay, it's sub only. I'm going to pull guard because it doesn't matter if I get passed. Mm -hmm. I pulled my guard right away. I pulled guard right away. I got passed. <laughs> And then I eventually got my guard back. And then from there, it was a little bit better. But like right away, pulled guard, got passed. And then that was the first time. And then I, I won the match and I won the tournament. But it was like, I think I got passed twice that day. My what first what belt pulls. were you at this? Blue belt. Blue belt. All right. All right. So uh, I think it was the first time I ever saw you uh, compete. I saw you out wrestle people. And I was like, oh, this guy's got great wrestling. And then it wasn't long after that I saw you pull guard. And I was yeah. like... <laughs> Another one, you know, another one bites the <laughs> dust, man. Another one joins the dark side. And so, <laughs> so um, on this, I thought it would be a good time here to move into the proper spelling of your last name. There was a, there was a fiasco <laughs> on the Fuji World Pro where yes. Chris Wadlick was fighting uh, Clay Mayfield and then something else too. There were two two mishaps on the last name weren't there i think so i think usually the first wadlick was wadlick was i'd never seen that before you know and i've had my name misspelled a lot um and then i think the second one usually what happens next is they ask how to pronounce it i say wojik and then they go w-o-j-i-c-k yeah see i could so, I, that's i feel like doable yeah it, wadlick it a was lot. a was a very different last <laughs> it would have been like if josh mcgregor was fighting on the card you know it's yeah, substantially exactly. different yeah. <laughs> so uh on on your you know like this is, is something we did on the podcast a few weeks ago and it kind of got a lot of feedback from it but it was the idea of learning to brand yourself and learning to uh get paid to do something in jujitsu mate without running a gym Right. Yeah. And um, that is something that you have been doing and trying to do uh, that I think is really interesting. I really wanted to kind of dig in on this, but uh, just I, I guess, how would you define yourself as a writer? What would you say like your, I guess, quote unquote job is? Uh, I think on your Instagram, it's jujitsu blogger. Yes. So that's I, uh, I have a blog. I do a lot of writing. I do. Um, so my non-jujitsu job i do copywriting and ghostwriting for businesses so that's like you know outside of jujitsu that's i have a uh like a ghostwriting company that i'm building up um which is like where you write and pretend to be other people basically it's like okay you know acting a little bit except writing and then uh, i have my blog on medium which i use um which is i just write you know kind of whatever i want um so as a lot of it is about jujitsu learning stuff uh but really I have no, like, there's no bounds, you know, I'm not like confined by anything, which is why I like it. So I can write about whatever I want. And then, um, wrote about jujitsu because I, I wrote the ebook about jujitsu just because I wanted to. Um, and then I also, then I teach and stuff too. And I think writing and teaching work together very nicely. Why do you think that? I think that writing is, is teaching basically, especially the nonfiction writing, you know, and I, I, I've written a little bit of fiction, but I prefer doing the nonfiction right now. And I think that nonfiction writing in most cases is some form of teaching. That is really interesting. I've never thought of it in those terms, but it makes sense to me. Uh, do you, let, let's start at the beginning. If you uh, are somebody who, did you go to school for writing? I went to school for multimedia journalism which was not supposed to be writing, but it ended up being writing. 
Okay. What, 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 what was it supposed to be? It was supposed to be like broadcast news. And I didn't realize that till I was like a senior because I, I didn't really pay attention too much when I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, was, I like it. <laughs> there was one day in class my senior year where they had us like get in front of a camera and talk. And I was like, wait a second. I didn't sign up to, I didn't sign up to be a newscast. <laughs> <laughs> you could have just leaned into it and just tried to be a newscaster. I, I don't think I'd be a, a great newscaster. I don't know. That's not really my personality. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so on your, that's, so you, you really didn't realize that until. So it was, the program was called multimedia journalism. And I was like, well, writing's a form of media, right? So uh -huh. that's, that's what I'll do. And then nobody else did that. So. Really? Where'd you go to school at? Uh, Loyola, Chicago. Okay. Uh, yeah. Anyone who is in Loyola, Chicago, just keep in mind, <laughs> if you want to be a writer, multimedia, they're not the, the, the medias that are multi, none of them are writing. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you are somebody who wants to start writing, uh, it, let's say specifically for jujitsu, where's a place to start? So I think that, so it was funny when I started writing, I remember like I, I was hesitant to start because I was already into jujitsu and I was like, okay, I'm, I like jujitsu and writing. I'm going to be broke forever. <laughs> and I, so then I started doing some research online and, you know, in college, no one teaches you like, Hey, this is how you make money as I actually, I wrote about this last week. Like college doesn't teach you how to make money as a writer. In college, college doesn't teach you how to make money is most things that you go to yes, school for. Yes. Especially like arts, art stuff, because mm -hmm. There's just kind of this assumption that you will be broke as a writer until you publish a best-selling book. Mm -hmm. And that is, especially with the internet now, that is no longer the case. There are tons of opportunities to make money online as a writer. And you don't have to even, you don't even have to be super good, mm -hmm. you know? And for me, like I started writing on Medium, which Medium has this thing called the Medium Partner Program to where your stories are. So you, you publish, I publish a story on Medium and then they based on how many people read it, how long people read it for. So if I publish a seven minute story and everyone takes seven minutes to read it, I get paid more based on how, how many people read it. Um, so I get money from the medium partner program. And then I write on Quora, which is, I'm sure, you know, Quora, uh -huh. it's like, if you type in a question, usually the two answers that come up are like Reddit and then Quora. Mm -hmm. So I think of Quora as like a less formal medium or a more formal version of Reddit. So I, I'm part of the Quora partner program too. So I get paid from Quora. That's um, so, cool. So That's... It's, it's just like YouTube or, you know, any other sort of, uh, it's just like, you know, podcasting video. It's all the same thing. Medium is just YouTube for writers. Mm -hmm. And so when I found that out, I was like, how come nobody told me about this? This is great. You know, and that's just stuff that I publish independently. And yeah, man, I take I take pride in knowing about most ways to make money online. And <laughs> I, I did not know uh, about like partner programs with those. Yeah, it's those have been and I've had some stories on Medium that have performed really well that have been read by like thousands, thousands of people. And those stories have, you know, like one story I made like nine hundred dollars from one story. And it's like a seven minute read, you know, which is what's the best thing you've ever written in your opinion? It's funny. So I wrote a story in February. That was my first viral story. It was called, this is why Buddhism bothers me. <laughs> and I just was kind of like, it was a, it was kind of a rant about how, like, about like the way people talk about like meditation in the West and stuff. Mm -hmm. and it was, it was a rant that it wasn't great, but it was, that was my highest earner. That was the $900 story. And then I think my best one was I wrote a story in September and it was about quitting and it was called, this is, I was called, I was average at everything I did until I learned how to do this. And it was about how you, everyone should learn how to quit stuff. If somebody, cause it doesn't just sound like writing is writing, right? At least making money on writing. Uh, you kind of do have to have, cause those are both really great, um, or tags and you know, really great, yeah. uh, uh, lines. Right. And so, 
uh, you, you do have to, I, I think, I, I forget who, I think it was Robert Kiyosaki has a story where he talks about how somebody came up to him and said they wanted to be a best-selling writer. And he said, uh, you know, and he, they showed him some of his work and he goes, yeah, you're a much better sell. You're a be- much better writer than me. He goes, but you need to focus on the selling, not yeah. the writing. Um, and so on that, do you have any advice for somebody who does have some skill in writing um, and is still needing to understand how to get people to read it? There's a great book. Um, it's called The Art and Business of Online Writing. And it's written by a guy named Nicholas Cole, who he actually, he grew up in uh, the Chicago suburbs. So I, uh, I really, I enjoyed his work when I started writing online because he had kind of a similar background to me. And he was the, he's been the, he's the most viewed writer in Quora history. He has over a hundred million views on Quora. And he wrote this book about writing online because Mm -hmm. people, you know, people talk about blogging, people talk about like different kinds of writing, but online writing is completely different you know, online, like traditional blogging is not really where writing is right now. Uh So right. Like online writing is if you publish on medium, you publish on Quora, you publish on LinkedIn, Substack, all that stuff. That's like where online writing is. And that is a, a game in itself. Is it still pretty new? Is it still, or I guess maybe, is it still pretty unheard of? I would say so. It's probably less than 10 years old. Um, online writing as a separate like entity, I think, because medium was launched, I think in 2011, but they didn't pay people till like 2015, 2016. So they've only been paying people for five years. Quora launched a partner program two months ago, I joined it. Um, And they, their partner program is still invite only. So that stuff's like still like super new. And there's some other sites too, but Quora and medium are like the two big ones. And then you're also trying to do your own thing with your email list, correct? Yes. Yes. Because in writing, if you have, I mean, if you have an email list, you can sort of like say what, like the email list is like people who opt in and they want to hear from you, you know? So they are there because they want to be there because you can unsubscribe from an email list at any time. The Mm -hmm. email list is totally voluntary. So with the email list, you can kind of be a little bit more experimental. And then from the email list, then you can start to plug products. You can start, you know, trying to monetize the email list. That's sort of how you would make money off of that. And that is something that when you ask certain people, a lot of people will try to tell you that the email list is dead. They say, oh, Instagram is where it's at and Facebook and YouTube is where it's at. But the problem with Facebook, let's say I have a million subscribers on my Facebook and I do something that Facebook's algorithm does not like. I could go from getting 100,000 views on it to 1,000 and I have no control over that. But with an email list, the only thing I have, you know, the only way people stop seeing my emails is if they don't open them or they unsubscribe, but they yeah. get them. Uh, and so it does, it does make a ton of sense. Uh, so with your email list, or do you do like a newsletter? Yep. Every Friday morning. What are things that people would expect to hear from you on that newsletter? So the newsletter is every Friday morning. I send it out at 9 a.m. I take my article from that week that I think is most relevant to my newsletter subscribers, which most of which are people who are either interested in personal development or jujitsu or, you know, that kind of stuff. And like learning stuff is kind of like the, the main kind of theme of the newsletter. So I take Uh whatever article I think is best to help people learn stuff. And I just plug it into the sub stack. And so it's already been published so you can view it on, uh, medium. If you're a paying member on medium, you can see it or it, you just get it for free on Friday morning on Substack. That's cool. So, so and then do I also you... will provide a list of all the other articles because I publish between four to six times per week on medium. And then I will also throw in a, uh, I sometimes will throw in some like quotes that I like or like book stuff, like just, you know, random things that I'm thinking about. So before we move on, uh, just a question on that. Do you have a, uh, like a big archive of things that you have written that you're waiting to release? Or do you write 
when you write? Do you say, this is the time I'm going to write today and you write? So I, my, my, my life is very like unconventional because, you know, I, I train jujitsu and I write full time. So that's like my two things. That's all I do. And so I have to, I, you know, like I want to, we train usually at 7 a.m. So I train early and then I write like, oh, I have time to write. Now I'm writing. Or like yesterday I had a bunch of meetings uh, with like writing clients and I trained in the morning and then I teach at night. So I didn't write till 10 p.m. So that was just, I just try to make sure I do a little bit every day. If you, do, do you, do you find trouble having an unconventional schedule? Do you run into problems with that? I do not. I like the unconventional schedule. I think it suits my personality better because I really don't like being like told what to do. You mm-hmm. know, I'm like one of those people who I like when I, like I had a couple regular jobs when I was like in high school and college. And I had like, I was just always, I was always the guy who got in fights with the boss and like, <laughs> I had opinions about how things should go. And it was like, okay, this is, this is not for me. I need to do my own thing. So I, I, I work, prefer the unconventional set schedule. I worked as a personal trainer for a while and did good with that, but I worked two regular jobs. Uh, I guess both would have been in high school. I worked for one day on each of them. I was, Oof. I was a bus boy for a day and <laughs> I was a lifeguard for a day and I quit both of them. I get the whole, I don't like being told what to do. I don't like the conventional, (laughs) the conventional job stuff. Like for me, I, so I grew up wrestling and in wrestling, it's like a lot of like just being told what to do and just doing it. And so Mm -hmm. I could do it, but I never liked it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, okay, just because I can do something doesn't mean I should do it. And there is a big difference when you're wrestling and you're being told what to do by a coach and then you go out and you have success and you win matches and stuff versus when you get told what to do by somebody who may not know, uh, you know, like that is always the, the, the tough thing about having a regular job is your boss. You could easily be smarter than your boss and know how yeah. to, you know, it's very possible. Uh, it's not always, everyone believes that they're smarter than their boss, but it's not always true. Uh, it, but it is tough. It's tough to, to be able to say, okay, this is just not for me. And I think more people are doing it now. Younger people are yeah. doing it now uh, and taking that risk. When did you know that you weren't going to be a, a, a nine to five guy? When I was, so I had a job as a summer camp counselor when I was, um, well, actually, you know, and honestly, I think it started when I was, when I started competing a lot because I was like, oh, no, none of the people here who are competing at a high level have, you know, like traditional jobs because mm-hmm. you can't train the way you need to train to fight at the high, highest levels mm-hmm. and also work 40 hours a week for somebody else. You know, it's, ve- I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's very difficult. Um, and so for me, when I started doing that, and then I had this job as a summer camp counselor and I, I like kids, I teach kids jujitsu, but I could not stand having to listen to the, like these people talk and then listening to the parents and having to be there for, it was like, I was there from like seven to four. So it was like, you know, not like a crazy long day, but it was during the day. And I didn't like that. I was like, I want to train at noon. And I have to and, be here and this is horrible. And kids tend to be a lot better when you're allowed to beat them up because you have a jujitsu <laughs> class. You know, kids behave much better when they're not behaving and you're like, okay, we're just doing live rounds today, kids. You're rolling with the coach. You know, they seem to act better. You can't do that when you're a camp counselor. No, you or, can't. It's frowned upon, I'm sure. <laughs> it is frowned upon. Yeah, I uh, I used to help in uh, at my church in children's ministry, and uh, my mom has always run the children's ministry. And uh, I got kicked out when I started. We started this game. We play it at jujitsu. It's it's safe. It's a safe game. But we basically put a circle on the ground, and you have to push each other out of the circle. And oh yeah, like so, sumo wrestling. Exactly. And so I'm just teaching these kids throws and how to just <laughs> injure each other. And then I got removed. I got uh, <laughs> that. I, I guess. I guess I lost that job too. That's funny. <laughs> so, so you, uh, you know, you talked about how you were saying writing is teaching. You know, or you're, you know, when you're reading, you should be learning. Do you have any tips for people to become better learners? Because that's 
pretty much going to be whether or not you're good at jujitsu is how good you can become at learning it. Yeah. So for me, I focus like when I think about learning, For a while, I used to think about trying to learn stuff because I've always like, I've always been fascinated by like polymaths, like Leonardo da Vinci and like people like that who were able to get so good at so many different things. So for a long time, I would try to focus on learning stuff, but then I realized that I don't want to learn different skills. I'm more interested in learning how to learn stuff. So I think that as a, if I think that if you can learn how to do one thing really well, you can learn how to do almost anything. And I think that, you know, so if you look at like what you've already learned, because most people who come into jujitsu are adults and they've learned how to do something before in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody learns differently, but I think that if you can develop like the self-awareness to kind of understand how you learn best, then you'll be able to improve as a learner. Like, and that goes, that's a Miyamoto Musashi quote. I think it's like, if you know the way you'll see it in everything or something like that. I have, I have a Miyamoto Musashi up in my room in the back there. It's uh, if you, something who is, about who is that? He's a Japanese samurai from the 1500s. He's a badass. He was okay. undefeated in uh, samurai matches. If you grappled him, would you be able to submit him? Yes. Okay, good. Just make it sure. Especially in the gi, he had no, he'd have no chance. No chance. Okay. <laughs> uh, do you, for, uh, what would be the way you say that you learn? What is your, cause you're saying people are specific with learning, but specifically to you. Um, for me. Yeah. Um, I am a, I would say I'm a relatively slow learner, but I think that I put a lot of time in that makes me seem like a fast learner. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, I get like, I'm very like kind of scatterbrained. I'm like a little bit all over the place uh, when I'm learning, but over like, I think that I connect dots unconventionally. So like I'll learn something and I'll learn the end first. And then I learn the beginning, you know, later. So I'm a little bit more all over the place, but I think that just knowing that makes me a better learner because that way, when I learn something, I'm not like, Oh, I didn't learn the beginning first. This is wrong. No, I just Mm -hmm. learned something and then I can work backwards. Um, So does that, when you, when you say that you, you kind of, you know, connect the dots, you learn differently. Did that ever discourage you? Did you ever say like, man, I can't learn stuff because I struggle with, you know, I don't learn the same way everyone does. That was, so that was a problem in school, but it was not a problem in jujitsu. Because I think in jujitsu, it's like unconventional learning is more encouraged. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas in school, teachers are very like, oh, no, no, this is how I taught, how to, I was taught how to taught. So you have to learn the way I was taught how to taught, mm-hmm. how to teach. How to teach. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, the um, Yeah, man, that's true. That is, uh, go, go ahead. Whereas in like jujitsu, it's like, okay, you can, let's just take what you know right now. And then let's just work from there because I can't teach you something you don't know, Mm -hmm. but I can teach you how to learn something that you don't know. You know, it's not just like shoving information in people's faces. It's more like teaching concepts. And then from there we can refine mechanics and stuff like that. That that's always a struggle that I notice people start with is that they think like the only time they've ever learned is in school and on Dora the Explorer, you know? So they don't know like how to, they, they don't know how to learn any other way than in school, which is like, okay, I'm going to do this. And then I take the test. And if I fail, I suck. And then if I, you know, like it, it's pro- I'm probably not cut out for this. And that's yeah. just, you know, you see that discouragement, but that's something I always have to tell my students like, Hey dude, this isn't school. It's okay. You didn't get it right today. You know, we'll yeah. just, do it tomorrow. You know, like it's not the, it's just a, it's a different mentality uh, learning on the mats. I think you get to experience so many different types of learning and, and types of ways to, uh, that people learn. I also think that the way that we learn jujitsu is more realistic for life. Mm-hmm. Like if you want to, if you can learn how to do jujitsu, I think you can learn how to do a lot of things versus if you learn how to learn in school, you might be able to learn how to do a lot of stuff, but it's not, I think it's less directly correlated. 
Mm-hmm. Like I know in my experience, there have been a lot of people that I've interacted with in jujitsu who just have so many skills and jujitsu is just one of them. Like I have, mm-hmm. you know, I have training partners who are successful business people across, like, you know, they have multiple businesses. They're good at running businesses or they're musicians. They're good at making music. They're good at making art, you know, whatever the skill is. And it's part of it. I, I think, you know, and some people will say, no, I just, I just do all this stuff, but I think there is a relationship between jujitsu and learning stuff. Do you think that, uh, uh, I guess I think this is always a fun thing to think about. Do you, do you think of jujitsu as art or do you think of it as you know, some people are more scientific in the way they look at jujitsu? So I think of it as I actually touched on this in the ebook at the beginning. I think of jujitsu as a martial art, as an art, but I mm-hmm. think that there, it is also a science because I think there's a sign, you know, there's a, a physical understanding of the human body that uh, Donna her talks about that. Like there's a physical understanding of the human body that's required in order to better break the human body, you know, mm-hmm. which is basically what we're doing. Um, but at the same time, there's also a creative component to jujitsu. You know, if you look at like the top guys out there right now who are, especially in the gi, I think the gi is a little bit more creative than no gi. Mm-hmm. Um, like, you know, you look at Keenan when he did with the lapel stuff, you look at the Barambolo stuff that like the Mendes brothers were doing back in the day. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is very creative in nature, but it also requires an understanding of the human body. It requires an understanding of gravity, you know, all sorts of different understandings of different concepts that might not seem like they're like related, but they are. And it's more of a scientific application than a solely creative pursuit. Would you consider your jujitsu more creative or more scientific? I think I go both ways. Um, I think that my, my personal stuff that I've like kind of like innovated a little bit is more creative Um, but I think also too, I have just like, I have a lot of time that I put in, you know, training for quite a few years now. So, you know, I think you kind of, you probably feel the same way. Like when you train for a while, it's like you understand the basics so well that it becomes Mm -hmm. creative, Mm -hmm. you know, like the, uh, the, the basics are like second nature, you know, like the understanding of, okay, if I, I can't pull somebody like this or whatever, cause I'm upside down or something, Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I understand how the body works. I understand how, like what people are going to do to react. And because of that, I can become creative in how I move forward towards the submission. That, that makes sense. I always think of it like if I understand what movements I can make that are powerful and what movements that you can, that you can't make, you know, the movements that are weak for you uh, and just look to apply those things. That's where a lot of the, my creativity in jujitsu comes from is by knowing that it, knowing the physics part of jujitsu uh, and saying like, okay, he's going to be weak in this space. So if I just put my arm in that space, he's going to be weak there. It's going to be all right that I'm, you know, I don't know this position very well. I think that that can create uh, a lot of fun um, uh, just a lot of creativity in jujitsu. I also find though, and I don't know if you do that there can be people that are trying to be too creative in their jujitsu and it kind of stifles their growth. Do you ever notice that? Um, yeah, I think that definitely happens. I think that if you start to sacrifice your understanding of like the basics of how jujitsu works and how the human body works and you start focusing solely on creative expression, I think that you're going to struggle to kind of progress and kind of, I think your creations just won't work if you don't understand the basics. And that's, Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. What do you consider the basics? So I would say kind of like an understanding of how the human body works, you know, how like I have, okay, I have two arms. I have two legs. That's a given. I have a head, you know, I have a neck. My neck is this long. This is kind of like the basics of what you're trying to do. You're trying to attack the human body. And then Mm -hmm. also, I guess the gi grips would be another example of the basics, like just basic grip, gi grips, collar grips, pants grips, that kind of stuff. And then gravity as well. When you say gravity, what do you mean? Um, So when I'm a bottom person, 
like because zero gravity jiu-jitsu would be totally different from regular jiu-jitsu where there's gravity because in zero gravity closed guard is the same as mount that makes sense that's so, true yeah i've so never thought be- about zero gravity jiu-jitsu <laughs> I feel like you should, I feel like if you haven't written on zero gravity jujitsu, <laughs> that would be an awesome thing to write about. I would read that would it. be, that would be interesting. Zero gravity jujitsu. What we'll have to do is in a few years, I'll get the podcast huge okay. and you'll have your writing huge. Okay. We're making millions of dollars. I'm thinking that space travel will be cheaper by that point, And okay. we'll be able to, uh, go into space and do zero gravity jujitsu. We'll film it. It'll be cool. Would we do zero gravity gi or no gi? It'd be gi. It's got to be gi. It would be weird <laughs> if it was no gi, you know? Because uh, you think about it, you're always getting pushed away in zero gravity. I feel like it would just be hard to keep connection in no gi. We would just be like trying to swim in the air towards each other. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah, so that'll be, um, I'll, I'll set a date. I'll, I'll send you a calendar invite for that. Okay, one. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. That sounds like fun. But so that kind of goes back to like the understanding that you need in order to like have like basic grappling, you know, you have to understand how gravity works because I know for me, like sometimes when I try to make up moves in my head, I don't factor in gravity. So like I'll make up a move and I'm like, Oh no, I can't lift you like this because gravity or, you know, you're, you're too far away and I'm not like physically long enough to reach your belt or whatever I'm trying to do in this specific move. So if you can understand kind of those basic things, that's going to allow you to innovate more. That makes sense. I I like, so I always ask people what the basics are of jujitsu. And the answer I always get is closed guard arm bar. And uh, I feel like it's not, I, not that it's not a good answer, but I I really love the answer that you gave the, uh, the basic, I guess the the things that are always happening in jujitsu that aren't just a technique. And uh, I think that that is something when somebody understands that those are the people that seem to be able to learn a move and apply it very quickly or to be able to be more creative and stuff is people that do understand the, I'm trying to think of the right word that the things that keep happening over and over in jujitsu, where we're always looking for the hip space or the armpit space or something like that. And when we start to just learn that and apply it to our other techniques, it's really helpful. I think that I wasn't able to understand that until I started teaching, because I think that when you're teaching something, you have to kind of understand like, okay, the reason that someone is struggling with this move is not because they didn't not that, not because they don't understand it, not because they don't know how gravity works. It's just that they haven't seen the application of gravity in that setting, you know? So like when you show a closed guard arm bar, like a a good example, that's a good example because in a closed guard arm bar, you have to rotate your hips. Mm -hmm. So you have to push off of your opponent's hips and because gravity you push off the hips and you go to the angle. You ro- push and then rotate. And since gravity, you go to the side. If it was zero gravity, you'd push and you would go like out. You know, you kind of float away. I have never thought of gravity in jujitsu as an actual thing, but. Uh, oh, it's definitely a thing. Yeah, I know. I've never, <laughs> I have absolutely. And I think about jujitsu a lot. And uh, yeah, I've never thought about. The use, I mean, you always think about the use of gravity on top, uh, but I guess I've never thought of it in a sense of pushing. That's a really interesting uh, kind of thought or idea. Uh, I really like that. I'm going to, I'm going to start thinking about gravity (laughs) and zero jujitsu, zero gravity jujitsu more. I'm excited. I think that this could be a really interesting like niche sport. It's like zero gravity, zero gravity grappling. Yeah, I feel like it could be grown for sure. I don't know logistically though the cost per event, and uh, <laughs> you know, and you know, I don't know how. I feel like broadcasting it would be easy because you'd be in space. You know, like I don't. Yeah, yeah I don't know how that really works. I don't know much about space, but I assume all the satellites <laughs> are up there. Make it easy to broadcast for or broadcast your jujitsu. What would it be called? 
I like zero gravity grappling. Zero gravity grappling. That's good. That's good. Or, you know, I'm, I'm sure that someone who's like a more like marketing savvy than I am could probably think of something better, but it could be, it could just be like no grav or something like that. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no grav grabbing. And that'll be, that'll be what they'll call it. Um, so uh, I always like to ask, I wouldn't say always, cause this is, this is our new finishing question. I haven't done it many times, but I always like to finish with uh, the same question on the show. And it is now, what is the best advice that you've ever gotten in jujitsu? Are you talking about like for competing or for learning? Or- when I, when I say what's the best, what are you, for you, what is the, what, what you advice that you look at and you go, man, my life would be drastically different probably for the worse if I did not get this advice. Hmm. This might be cliche, but I think like getting comfortable being uncomfortable is the best jujitsu advice that I've gotten that applies to like all of life, like whether it's jujitsu, whether it's learning, whether it's competing, whatever you're doing, if you can develop the ability to be comfortable being, you know, and I think it's one thing if you're like, okay, like you're seeking out like pain for you know, the sake of suffering, I think that's more problematic. But I think that if it's more like, okay, I'm just, uh, this is uncomfortable right now, like uh, your nerves before you compete. I think that if you can be comfortable having nerves before you compete, or if you can be comfortable having no idea what you're doing, like when you're, whether you're a beginner or whether you're an advanced person who's trying to learn a new technique, if you can be comfortable not knowing or just being in an uncomfortable setting, I think that you will reap the benefits in the long run. And then the same goes for like anything else that you do in life, short-term discomfort for long-term gratification. Do you feel like that you came into jujitsu knowing that since you had wrestled? Yes. I think that's been the best thing for my jujitsu career has been having known that like discomfort is not necessarily a bad thing. While we have just a few minutes left, I just wanted to do a quick, because I think you do a really good job of this. Uh, I wanted to do just some quick thoughts on uh, competing and dealing with the anxiety of competing and uh, kind of your thoughts on that. Okay, cool. So let's start with, uh, do you get nervous when you compete? Oh, yeah. Do you, you always have? Yeah, yeah. Ever, I started competing when I was 12, you know, in wrestling. And I've competed, you know, ever since then. And I've never not been nervous. Not like, you know, it used to be like severe. Uh And now it's more, it's just, oh, this is my nerves. And I'm experiencing them. What do you do to deal with them? Um, I do, I do a couple different things. I have, so for me, I, there's a, 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 do you know Sam Harris? Mm -hmm. He's a, he used to, he's been on like all the, big podcasts and stuff. He's a author and philosopher and psychologist and neuroscientist. Uh, he talks about how neurologically anxiety and excitement are the same. So the difference between anxiety and excitement is nothing that happens to you. It's just your, the story that you're telling yourself. So before we compete, we're nervous because we're telling ourselves a story that things are going to go wrong. Mm-hmm. And then if we can switch that story and we can say, oh, no, no, I'm just really excited for this tournament or because it's going to be, you know, there's going to be adrenaline and I'm thinking about the adrenaline and all this stuff. So I'm just so excited. That's a going to ease the discomfort and it's going to make that discomfort more pleasant because, you know, being excited is fun. You know, it's fun to be like fired up and Mm -hmm. excited about stuff. So if I can like switch the story when I'm nervous to, um, just an excited story. That's much better for me. Like I'll like, I like, you know, for me, I like to listen to music. I listen to like really loud music before I compete just because it makes me excited. Make it drown, like literally it drowns out the nerves and it switches them into excitement. So then when I go back and then I fight and then I bring, I bring my breathing down. So I'm like focused and then I just go and I can do my thing. What is your self-talk look like then when you're trying to get yourself excited? What do you 
So I, I, w- I'm not like trying to get myself excited. It's already there. Um, because I'm like, I'm nervous, which means I'm feeling excited too. Mm-hmm. And then if I can just switch that, the story from the anxiety and make it an excited story. So I'll be, I'll tell myself, I get to be here. You know, I don't, cause if we get, if it's, it's almost like, if you think about it, especially in a sport like jujitsu, where like you're paying to compete most of the time or you're competing in, for no money, you know, it's like, why would I be nervous about this? If I don't have to do it, I can stop whenever I want. Mm-hmm. So I try to just tell myself, Hey, no, I get to do this. Um, and especially like now for me, like I've gotten to compete under some really cool stages. You know, I've competed for world championships. I've competed on like a bunch of super fight shows. I've done, you know, competed at all the major tournaments. It's like, wow, this is cool. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, wow, this is scary. I just say, wow, this is cool. And then I feel a lot better because the anxiety never goes away, you know, but if you can deflect the story, it will be easier to handle. That makes, that's a really, really good advice on, on competing. I always tell my students, like, right. When I see someone nervous, like, dude, you know, on Monday, you are going to have had the coolest experience at anybody else at your work at the water cooler. You know, you're going to (laughs) have old lady cron yachts could have jumped out of a helicopter and you would have still had a more exciting and a cooler experience getting to go and fight somebody. Uh, I, I love that reframing uh, to excitement. That is really good. So uh, at this point on the show, I always like to ask, is there anything, you know, we talked about your ebook, we talked about your blog. Uh, is there anything that people might want to follow you on to, to kind of get more information about you? Um, yes, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Chris M. Wojcik, which is M for my middle name because Chris Wojcik was taken. Um, oh man, <laughs> you should have went with Chris Wadlick. That would have been, I should have, that is probably available. I'll have to look, <laughs> um, but yeah, Instagram, Chris M. Wojcik. Um, I I'm on Twitter. I like words. So I am on Twitter too. Um, swinging a Chris on Twitter. Um, and then medium, just Chris And then my newsletter is called who's that on the mat. And I publish every Friday. All right. And we will make sure to put all of those in the description of the episode. So if you guys want to follow Chris on anything, you will be able to. Chris, thank you so much for being on, man. It was fun. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you. And that is the episode. Hope you guys enjoyed this one. Uh, I really had fun doing this one. I don't know if you noticed my response time in this episode is a little slower than usual. And it is not from lack of caffeine. It is uh, from migraines. Man, I deal with migraines this time of year because of my sinuses like for like a month straight. And it sucks. If anyone has any... I've asked this before on the podcast, but if anyone has any unique ways to deal with migraines uh, that isn't something that I could just read on the first page of Google that works, let me know. Uh, I've been dealing with those since I was a kid and they suck. But something that doesn't suck was this episode, I think. I hope. I hope you guys agree with that. Uh, But Chris did such a good job, even me being slow, uh, being able to answer and have really good answers for some of the stuff that we were talking about, especially since we started talking about some stuff that was not planned on at all. And so uh, if you guys want to follow Chris or any of his writing, I will be sure to link everything in the description of the episode. And that's all I have for you guys today. I hope today's episode helps you guys uh, get better. I hope it motivates you guys to start writing or to start learning to brand yourself. Uh, Just some idea of starting uh, to to gather an audience for your jujitsu and so you can make money doing jujitsu one day. Uh, And most importantly, I hope this episode helps you suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. Have a great day, guys. What's up, guys? Josh here again. I just wanted to tell you, give you a little more information on some of the other content that I produce that isn't just the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. If you are wanting more information on how to become more efficient and effective 
in your jujitsu training, the number one thing that I always recommend to people is my Patreon page, the I Suck at Jujitsu Show Patreon page, because we release a five to 15 minute exclusive episode every single Saturday. This is called Suck Less Saturday, and it is completely focused on being for your jujitsu training, for your jujitsu mindset, and for your jujitsu progression. And so what we'll do is a quick but deep dive on a different thought, idea, or training method every single Saturday. And you can only get this on our Patreon page. I also have a few spots open, depending on what time you're listening to this podcast, for my suck less coaching. What that is, is a monthly cost to get a monthly meeting with me where we meet over Zoom and set some goals based on what you are trying to accomplish in Jiu-Jitsu and set some different training methods uh, to help you get there. Uh, there's nothing like this online right now. There is no Jiu-Jitsu coaching that teaches you how you should be training. Uh, and. It is exclusively on the I Suck Jiu-Jitsu Patreon page. Also, if you guys want to just be in more contact or you want to learn a little more about my ideas in Jiu-Jitsu, I highly recommend that you subscribe that you sign up for Simplifying Jiu-Jitsu. It is a free ebook. It is at simplifyingjujitsu.com. And what we do is we break down the top five positions, the essential five positions of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. These are the five positions where most Jiu-Jitsu, 90 plus percent of Jiu-Jitsu takes place in. And we break down how to train them, how long you should be training them, and what order uh, you can train these things to progress fast faster and easier with your jujitsu. And lastly, if you guys would just give this show a subscribe and a share, it would be very greatly appreciated. Also, you can review us on certain uh, podcast platforms. If you guys want to keep up with me personally, you can follow me at my Instagram at the Josh McKinney. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you for listening. I hope that you guys listen to the next one.